morning, everybody. Uh, if you have a Bible or an app, go ahead and turn to the book of John, chapter 8. My name is Andrew, one of the pastors here. It's good to have you with us today. In the book of Exodus, we meet a guy named Moses. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe not, I don't know. Um, he's a pretty obscure character in the Bible, and he has an interesting story, to say the very least. This was a man who was born in very tricky times. His mother hid him so that he wouldn't be killed. And then as he became older, he actually committed a murder trying to protect one of his people from an Egyptian who was beating him up. And though he, so he flees and kind of tries to live his life in hiding having committed this sin. And so he's working for his father-in-law, he's a sheep shepherd, and he's, he's about one day doing his shepherd thing, and I don't know where, he sees this bush, and it's on fire, but it just stays on fire, and it doesn't get consumed by the fire. So he's like, wait a minute, super weird, I'm going to go check that out, which I don't know if I would have gone towards it, but Moses is not me. He goes to the bush. And God calls to him from the bush and says, Moses, come to me. Moses says, here I am, Lord. And he tells Moses, take off your sandals for what you are standing on now is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hides his face because he's afraid to look at God and and then God replies to him and says this. He says, I have heard the cries of my people. I know that my people are enslaved. I know that they are suffering. I know that this is a time and a season of hardship for my people. But I've, I've heard their cries. And it is my intention to liberate them from the imprisonment and the slavery of Egypt and Pharaoh. I know their sufferings, he says. And he says, the cry has come to me. And Moses I'm going to send you to liberate them on my behalf. Now Moses, the story of his calling is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture because all of his responses and rebuttals are things I think that you and I would say in this very same circumstance. He's basically sending this guy, asking him to go against the greatest power in the known world, and he says, I'm going to send you and you're going to free your people. You're going to free my people. And Moses says what I think any of us would say, which is, who am, who am I that I should go? I'm not anyone special. But he says, I'll be with you. And this will be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And here's the crux of what I want to get at in Exodus here. In verse 13 of Exodus 3, it says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God then said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. I am who I am. The I am has sent me to you. God here is doing something that he does in other places of Scripture, and he is establishing his glory and his might and his power. He is establishing for Moses and for his people the fact that he has always existed, that he is all-powerful, and that though this task in front of them seems impossible or insurmountable, he has intended good for his people, and the fact that he is the I Am is the reason that they can have confidence that this will, become, this will come to pass. Fast forward to, sorry, Ginger, I laughed at you. <laughs> Your face was really funny, I'm sorry. Fast forward to the days of Jesus, 
And we, it's okay. And we have this dialogue that Jesus has been in with the Pharisees for a long time. Don't worry, next week the scene is going to change. So if you guys are tired of hearing about how they're talking to the Pharisees and Jesus is talking to them, don't worry. I'm tired of it too, but next week it's going to be a little bit different. So come back. Last week, you may remember, Jesus said the very kind and loving and savory words, and he called these men of God that they're, he said that you're children of the devil and not of God. And so things are going great in the dialogue here. And so, we pick up in verse 48, they basically say to him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and that you have a demon? Basically, this means you're, you're basically, I think, I, based on what you're saying, Jesus, our assessment of this is that you're an enemy of God's people and that you have serious mental issues, basically, is what he's, they're saying. That would be our modern translation. You are a crazy heretic and you are against us. Are we not right in saying that based on what you have said to us? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So God, in Exodus, in the Old Testament, has established his glory through what he has said, through what he has done. He has established the fact that he is holy and set apart. This is the God that... um, all of God's people would have heralded and worshipped and built their lives and their faith and their community around. And here comes Jesus, and one of the, probably the main point of conflict in Jesus' time and in his ministry has been this fact that he is saying, yeah, I know that guy, he's my father. Yeah, I know that guy, he's given me authority to come and to preach and to heal and to do miracles. Yeah, I know that guy, the only way back to him is through me, not through keeping the law like you think. This has caused, this is a serious disruption of life as they knew it. And so what Jesus is doing throughout all of his ministry and all of his dialogue with the Pharisees and those who are around and listening is he's trying to say and make clear the fact that I am connected to God. I am God. I am separate from the Father, but I am equal in power. And he has given me authority. We are we are united in the trinity and jesus is trying to catch everyone else up to the fact that this is who he is this is who he has claimed to be he's made legal arguments he's done miracles he's done everything in his power so far to prove to them who he is and yet their hearts remain hard and so today this dialogue is going to come to an abrupt end as you will see but jesus in this time is going to tell us a lot about his glory given to him by the Father and what that means for those who choose to follow him. He's going to make clearly the case that he is God. He's saying to these Pharisees, I I honor God and, and he's the one that glorifies me. I don't glorify myself. He said elsewhere in John 5 that I don't seek glory from people. God is the one who lifts me up and has glorified me. And he says, if anyone abides in my word and obeys, they shall not see death. They do not see death as death. Their life may come to an end here on this earth, but their soul will carry on. And so we need to talk about glory a little bit, because if you've you've been in church for any period of time, or you've even like heard a church service, or you've heard a Christmas song, you've heard this idea and concept of glory thrown around and discussed quite a bit. And if I'm honest... Maybe you can be honest as well. Most of the time I hear that word or we talk about that word and it just seems like this ethereal, angelic adjective or attribute of God that talks about how great and marvelous he is. And that's true, but we need to get a more full picture of what glory is because glory isn't just some esoteric thing about God. Glory, the glory of God matters for you and for me in our daily life. Another way to put this might be, why does God's glory matter to me? I know he is great. I know he is above all. Maybe you don't believe that. But that's, if you are a follower of Christ, that is what you believe. But what does that mean for you and me? 
Anytime we talk about glory, we have to talk about C.S. Lewis because he wrote a book called The Weight of Glory, and it's, it's very helpful. And I wanted to read this passage about it because um, I think it actually summarizes how I feel and maybe how you feel as well. He says, I turn next to the idea of glory. There's no getting away from the fact that this idea is very prominent in the New Testament and in early Christian writings. Salvation is constantly associated with palms, crowns, white robes, thrones, and splendor like the sun and stars. All this makes no immediate appeal to me at all. And in that respect, I fancy I am typical, I'm a typical modern. I'm like, yeah, I, I get that too. Glory suggests two ideas to me, one which, of which one seems wicked and the other ridiculous. Either glory means to me fame or it means luminosity. As for the first, since to be famous means to be better known than other people, the desire for fame appears to me as a competitive passion and therefore of hell rather than heaven. As for the second, who wishes to become a kind of living electric light bulb? So what he's doing here is he, is he is drawing out how we typically think of the word glory, how we typically think of God's glory. It's like either it's this like vainglorious competitive thing where you are above all others, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If I'm, if I'm to partake in that, I don't really want to. And the other thing is this glory, like something that is luminous and shining. And he's like, that has no appeal to me either. Why is that a good thing? It just feels arbitrary and strange. And here's the big idea. He basically uses the word weight to describe glory. Glory is substance, the substance of God's goodness, his holiness, his perfection, and all that is good about him is caught up in his glory. And here's the thing about you and me and the point that he makes is that you and I don't want to just witness things that are beautiful and glorious. There is something within you and I that desires to partake of that glory. For, for you to go and to, to, to see a picture of the wilderness sparks something within you that is, that is beautiful, that is God's creation, but to, to be in the woods, to be on the mountaintop, to feel the wind, to smell the earth is a completely different experience. To see pictures of delicious meals and food prepared is, is one thing, but if you were to just go to a feast and, and look at the meal, you, you would know deep down that you are missing out on what it means to partake in that glory. That's why we pine for so many things as created men and women. It's because seeing glory isn't enough for us. We need to partake in the glory. And what, when we say that God is glorious, when we talk about God's glory, it's not just a title, it's not just an attribute. It means that he has, he has a weight and a gravity about him that in Christ we are to partake of and to draw to. He has weight to draw worship to himself. You say you are glorious and you are worthy because he is above all. He has weight to draw worship to himself. He has weight in his glory to exercise authority over the things and the people that he has created. Glory is not just laurels. Glory is not just acclaim. Glory is substance and weight. And when we call God glorious, that's what we are saying about him. He has magnitude. There is a gravitational pull about God. And that you and I, made in his image, are, are designed and in fact invited to partake in that glory, to enjoy and to know God intimately. And this is written on our hearts. What inspires awe in your life? What are the things that, that move you to tears? What are the things that get you up in the morning? What are the things that you work all week to partake of on the weekend? And what's hard about this kind of a conversation is to get us to agree that we all actually are craving and longing for the same thing, which is the presence of God and relationship with God, is, is stunning and weird and feels kind of strange to say because everyone in this room has different passions and different things that move them. My brother is a huge fan of fiction. He reads fiction voraciously. He and Joel get in competitions for reading fiction or something. I don't know. They, who can read the fiction books the, the fastest? Yes, Joel's amening that fact. 
They love it. They talk about the stories. They compare notes about the stories. I hear them talking about it, and I tune out, but I know that they're talking about it. And they are they're moved by these stories. And it makes zero sense to me. But then I watch the Warriors play, and I watch the ball move perfectly around the arc to hit an open man for a three, and, and, and something wells up inside of me. This must be what the fiction book feels like. <laughs> I am participating in something that is beyond myself. I am caught up in the glory of the moment. I don't know what it is for you. All of us have these things that move us outside of ourselves. And those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but, but, they, are, but they are in you because you and I are called and, in fact, designed to partake of the glory of God. When we talk about God's glory, it's not just some, some praise that we heap on a vainglorious being. It is an attribute of who he is, and, and you and I were designed to partake of it, not to just observe it. You are created to revel and to deeply enjoy God himself. We're created to do it. A, a life that is fully lived is a life that experiences well. Is that not true? And for us, as those made in his image, the deepest pursuit, the deepest culmination of that is to revel in and deeply enjoy the God who made us. Now, that sounds great on paper. And I'm sure each of you listening have a million objections to why that may not be true, why you may think it to be true, but why it is so hard to do, why it may be theoretically cool, but my experience walking with two feet on this earth is not a mirror image of what you're talking about, Andrew. And I understand that. And Jesus is actually going to address it. God's glory is above us. God's glory is more than we can comprehend. God's glory is makes him a God who is worth worshiping because he is bigger and mightier than us. But what Jesus is saying here is that God is, by sending him, by blessing him, by, 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 by having Jesus come and live and embody the character of God himself, that God is glorifying Jesus. And that Jesus is walking with this glory as well. But the thing about glory, the, way, the thing about seeing the glory of God is that it gets clouded. We get distracted. Life gets in the way. Our perspectives get in the way. And then we cannot see the glory that we are meant to see and partake of. In verse 52, the dialogue continues. And the Jews said to Jesus, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father? Abraham, who died, and the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Basically, they're saying this. Okay, Jesus, you grew up in the Jewish faith. You know how big of a deal Abraham is. You know how big of a deal all of these prophets are that we've studied and that we've taught and that we've built our whole life around their teachings and their ways. And you're saying, if you abide in my word, Jesus, you will never taste death. So, so basically what you're saying is all these guys got it wrong. None of these guys are, are set apart. None of these guys were actually hearing from God and doing the work that God had asked them to do. Who do you make yourself out to be to make such claims? In verse 54, Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who gives me glory, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it, and he was glad. But Jesus here is doing something, he's, he's doing the right, he's doing a very good thing in making his argument. He's saying, you guys all think that I'm propping myself up, but it's actually God who is propping me up. I don't glorify myself. I am God has sent me, God has honored me, and God is glorifying me in my life here on earth as the Son sent for the hope of the world. Proverbs 25, 27, it's not up on the screen, says, It is not good to eat much honey, 
nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. Book of Proverbs, always, always timely and good. It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. It's equating there this idea of self-glorification, like you're just like gorging yourself on sweets. It tastes good, but you're killing, your, 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 your stomach's going to be a mess afterwards. And what Jesus here is doing is he, is he is letting God do the work of glorifying him. He is not glorifying himself. He is pointing to the ways that the scriptures have pointed to him. This is the work of salvation over the work of self-promotion. And what he's saying in bringing in Abraham and the prophets is he's saying that those you respect, those that you look up to most in the faith, those the, one, the ones that you esteem as the greatest men of God were actually the ones that were looking forward to me. Their hope was that I would come. Now, there's, there's discussion about what this really means. Was it just an allusion to Abraham's confident faith in God? Was there a special event where Jesus showed up to Abraham? There's evidence of that in some of Genesis. Any, either one could be true, but the point is Abraham got it. The prophets got it. They knew that they were looking forward to a new ruler, a new king, a Messiah for God's people that would set all things right. And what the religious elites of the day have done is basically ignored everything they've looked forward to and have constructed their own life separate from the hope of the Messiah to come. You see, what they didn't realize is that the real prize in their faith and in their hope and in their expectation was Jesus, not their pursuit of moral perfection. Abraham, who they revered, he got it. The men of old in the scriptures, they, they were able to look forward to Jesus and what he was going to do. Well, here we have men, here we have a whole community built upon pursuing the wrong thing, built upon prioritizing their own greatness, built upon, if I may, their own self-glorification. Jesus is saying, you guys are actually doing the very thing that you're accusing me of. One of the greatest sources of regret, sometimes an article will pass through your feed and it's they interview maybe a hundred people as they were dying or something like that. And the clarity of the end of life brings, brings some perspective. And one of the biggest regrets summed up is not pursuing the, the real most important things in life. Many of the quotes say things like, I wish I had worked less and spent more time with my family. I wish I hadn't been so worried about having enough money and had prioritized my efforts in another way. I wish I had seen that there are things that are more important than being right all the time and there would have been a lot more peace in my home if I had just had some humility. There is deep regret from not pursuing the real things in life because here's what happens the real things get clouded right the things that matter the most get clouded in the day-to-day -day activity they, they they bump down on the priority list other things that are more pressing and more urgent fly to the top and we spend our energy and our effort and our days attacking those but just because they're of high urgency does not mean they're of high importance necessarily the deepest regret comes from not pursuing the things in life that give true life because they get clouded away by the urgent. And so I'm going to ask you, as I ask me, as we look at a text like that, are you more like the Pharisees, concerned with your priorities, or is Jesus truly the prize and the hope of your heart? Or is he clouded? Is he obstructed by the cares of the world? Is he obstructed by ideology? Is he clouded so that you can't see and partake of his glory because of sin in your life that you won't repent of? See, it's easy to say that Jesus is our Lord. It's easy to say that Jesus is most precious to me. It's easy to say and even go to church and act as if those things are true, but only you and God know if he is the prize in your heart. 
if he is what you are pursuing, or if other things have clouded his glory. You know, we talk about making Jesus known at this church a lot. And that may seem redundant or like an obvious thing to say in a church, but I assure you it's not, because all of us struggle with this. That his glory, his person, his work, and what that glory means for you and I on a daily basis and in eternity needs to be made crystal clear because then we can pursue him the way that we've pursued everything else that's more apparent and obvious. We lift up Jesus because he should rest at the seat of our affections. We teach about Jesus to remove the clouds that we may see him clearly and understand who he is and what he has done. And we praise Jesus because those moments in his presence strengthen us with the overwhelming reality that he is for us in Christ and not against us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is worth treasuring. And I think that for so many of us, we think we've won in our faith because we agree with that statement. When there is more of him to partake of, there is more to learn from him, there is more of us to set at his feet that he might use us as instruments in his hands. But who he is is so clouded by our life, by our prejudices, by our inconsistencies and our sin. There's no silver bullet here. There's no secret thing. The way to see Jesus more clearly is to continually repent of the sin that sin clings so closely, to put ourselves before God and say, you are God and I am not. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. We talk about pride a lot and that the Pharisees are such an embodiment of a prideful heart, a stubborn heart, a heart that will resist God's authority and exert their own instead. And maybe the reason you and I aren't seeing Jesus clearly is because we have our own pride that has kept us from him. We are so certain that the way we view the world is correct. We are so certain that we are good people. We are so certain that we know everything we need to know about Jesus. We are so certain that we have tasted all there is to taste of a life united with God. So I ask you, as I ask myself, is he clouded in your vision this morning? Are you able to see Jesus clearly? Because when we can see him clearly, then we can pursue him rightly. Verse 57, Jesus continues. So the Jews are the Pharisees are really tripped up by this whole Abraham thing. They're confused about it. They're uncertain. They're, they're wrestling with it. And they say to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? They're like, what? what? How do you know what Abraham was hoping for? How do you know this, all this stuff and this information about Abraham? You're not even 50 yet. Abraham lived a long time ago. What is happening? So they're, they're still like caught up in the minutia of how this could even be possible that Jesus knows all this stuff. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And that phrase, I am, is the exact same one used by God when he spoke to Moses from the bush that was burning and yet not consumed. He's saying, Abraham came and Abraham went, but I have always been. Revelation 1, 8 describes God in this way. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, and who was who is and who was and who is to come. And Jesus is basically saying, by using this phrase, unapologetically and without any uncertainty, that he is God. Way above Abraham. Way above the prophets that were esteemed. Way above any, certainly any, opinion that these men had of Jesus. He is the incarnate Logos, the Word of God in the flesh, speaking to people, speaking to men, speaking to women, embodying the character and the person and the glory of God himself. In Leviticus chapter 24, 16, 
It says this, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. So Jesus here has just called himself God. And so in verse 59, they all pick up stones to throw at him. Earlier, this chapter started out with Jesus protecting a woman from being wrongfully stoned. And now, it is, now the stones and the anger and the animosity have been turned on Jesus himself. And here's what's tricky about this text, is that they, if you don't see Jesus rightly, if you don't see Jesus clearly, they are acting, sort of, in good faith. Now, in Deuteronomy, it says clearly that you, this can't be like mob, you can't stone someone with like mob violence, which is exactly what they're doing. There was no trial, there was no discussion, nothing, they were just angry. That's not okay. But they, they could, they still, after all of this, can't see Jesus for who he is. And he just blatantly said to them, I'm God, I'm him. And Brothers and sisters, I'll, I'll, I'll close with these few thoughts. It's, it's easy, I've said this before, it's easy to have 20-20 hindsight when we look at the Pharisees. It's easy for us to, to look down on their pride. It's easy for us to say, how could they not see what was plainly right in front of them? It's easy for us to say, how could you not see that Jesus is who he said he was? Or why did you not believe that Jesus was who he said he was? Things would have been so much better for you. There would have been so much less strife. There would have been so much less heartache and confusion. How could they miss what was so obviously there? But the same question comes to you and I. Because Jesus, the I Am, fully God and fully man, comes to us with the same question. What does it mean for Jesus to reign as God and Lord over your life and over mine? It is easy to dismiss, if we don't see him clearly, if we just take this as sort of a theological point here that we then apply to our network of ideas about who God is. Okay, he's God, that's part of his attributes. It's easy to dismiss then Jesus as one of many voices in your life telling you how to live, telling you what is best for you, telling you where the deepest and best life is found. But if he is God, if Jesus is God, whom we have placed our faith in, who, who we, we come to for forgiveness and for healing and for the life of God, if he is God himself, then everything changes. Because if he is God, then the authority, the might, the weight, the glory with which he has lived his life matters differently. If, if he is God, God, that means that God himself died that you and I might live united to God the Father. If he is God, it means that his words could never just be good teaching, but that they have authority and weight and glory behind them. If he is God, and if he has asked us to live in a certain way, and we acknowledge that he is God, then seeing him clearly means walking in light of what that means to have God say, this is the way, the truth, and the life. Brothers and sisters, his glory is to be partaken of, not just read and talked about. And there is grace. This life, this world cloud his glory all the time he is clouded through our own doubts he is clouded through the culture's opinion of jesus he is clouded through historians and philosophers trying to downplay the claims of the scriptures he is clouded by people pointing to the church and the church's hypocrisy and failing over the many years that the church has existed he is clouded by the fact that sometimes the Bible seems like an antiquated book that doesn't have any current day applications. He is clouded by things that we read and can't reconcile with our modern day life. He is clouded by our own sin and everything else in life that we treasure and cherish above him. 
But brothers and sisters, Jesus comes to you and to I and says these very words that he said to these men. Before Abraham was, I am. Before you were born, I am. Before the world was formed, I am. Before America existed, I am. Before everything you cherish in life existed, I am. And if that God is the God that you and I worship, and that glory is what we desire to partake of, and that a loving authority of God is, is the one that we submit ourselves to, then brothers and sisters, we have glory to partake of that is above our greatest imaginations and pursuits and longings. You and I are not called to be spectators of the glory of God our whole life. Being a Christian is not just some cosmic justification of your soul, and then we wait around until we get to be with God one day. God himself came in the flesh, not just a historically accurate person, not just someone who claimed he was God, but if you believe that he is God, then you believe that God died in our place. And it was only through that act and through faith in that act that we are won back to the God who formed us and loved us. His glory is to be partaken of, not just read and talked about. If you believe that Jesus is God, then you believe that he meant it when he said, it's better for me to go away and be with the Father that I may send a helper to be with you. That better than having the actual Jesus next to us is the, the spirit of the living God living inside of us through the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is really God and his words have the authority of God, when he says that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, then that might cause us to live differently as we face the darkness of this world. If Jesus is really God, then, then the invitations he have to be reconciled with God have different meaning and color and weight and majesty. If Jesus is really God, and if we see him clearly as that God, and if we partake of the glory he invites us into, then we can't help but follow him. We can't help but throw ourselves at his feet and say, God, I'm here. What will you have me do? God, I am here. My days are yours. God, I am here. My life is in your hands. God, I am here. Thank you for loving me enough to die in my place that I may live truly. God, I am here. May I put my pride at your feet. God, I am here. May I live the life you've called me to live. This sermon is a simple meditation on the fact that Jesus is who he said he is. But the problem is, is when Jesus says who he really is, some of us are drawn to that and some of us pick up stones because we don't like what that means for our life. If you believe that Jesus is really God, then that means something for your life. It means that we need to follow him. It means that we need to take his yoke and learn from him. It means that he can't just be one of a collection of voices from which we form our identity and our life. It means that all of who we are belongs to him if he is God. And if we call ourselves followers of Christians, little Christs. And I say this with no shame. And no guilt, because we all struggle with it, but so many of us are living with a clouded vision of Jesus. And we're caught halfway in the world and halfway following Jesus. And that life is frustrating to live. We will all have sin in our life. We will all fail. We will all never be perfect this side of heaven. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that in today's day and age, we have, we have lost what it means to follow someone who has authority over our life. Our current views of authority are skeptical at best. And for, for Jesus to come along and say, I am God, 
and I am Lord over your life. We, that's lost today. It's hard for us to understand what that really means. And so when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, and this is an invitation to the, all who listen to him to see him as God, and brothers and sisters, I am inviting you and I am inviting myself to see Jesus for who he really is. May we live our lives in such a way where we are, we are doing all we can to see him clearly. May we repent of the sin that, that clouds our vision of who Jesus is. May we, may we rid ourselves, not just of the sin in our lives, but as Hebrews says, of the weights that cling so closely and keep us from running the race we were created to, to run. The joy of being intimate with God and not just reading about him. We have been invited into more. We've been invited to partake of the glory that is God's. We do not become God. We are not equal with God. But, he, but enjoying his glory is a part of following God. Being caught up in his glory and who he is is part of enjoying God. And brothers and sisters, we need this joy. We need this hope. We need this glory if we are going to walk in the way that he's asked us to walk. Because without it, God is just a God on a page. But it is the living glory, the living God that calls to us, that beckons us, and that has promised that he, they will, he will never leave us or forsake us. I encourage you to see God clearly this morning. If Jesus is God and he is Lord over your life, what would that mean for you? What would that mean for me? What would that mean for us as a body of believers. Let's pray together as we contemplate that question. Father, thank you for your word. It is hard sometimes, God, to, to fully grasp what's here, to live as if it's real. And so, Lord, right now I commend all of us to your spirit. I commend us to the work that you are already doing. Jesus, forgive us for the times when, when we don't live as if you are Lord of our life. We know you do forgive. We know you're eager to forgive. We know, Lord, that you are eager for each of us to come back to you and to dwell with you. We know, God, that you are eager to forgive, eager to build up, eager to point us back to the life which is truly life. God, you are eager for us to be with you. The I am who was and is and is to come. And today we lift up Jesus in our hearts. We praise him. We are grateful for him with new hope and new joy. God, thank you for your son. Thank you for the ways in which you have made him clear to us. And I just ask for all of us that we would commit ourselves anew to letting him lead our whole life. That we would see your yoke the way you describe it, as easy and light. And that we would take it upon us and learn from you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you that you have glorified him. May we glorify him in our hearts as well. In Jesus' name, amen.